Okay, I just, uh, so we, what we are doing is going through the uh, assignment number three. So first two questions, uh, first question was just uh, non-coding. Second question was writing a Python function which evaluates the probability of a class for a logic regression model. Third question uh, has several parts. Uh, it's basically getting familiarized with the, with a, with a new data set, the first uh, couple of questions. Uh, first question, in fact, uh, what we wanna do is basically use the SGD procedure from assignment one. Okay, so sorry, assignment two uh, to fit this logic regression model. Okay, so we wanna build on what we have built before. So uh, hopefully those functions and uh, not just logic, not, not just the SGD procedure, but also for example, from assignment one, which you also use in assignment two, which is decision trees and KNN, they're all nice and, and you have hopefully extended them or cleaned them up so that they can be reused again and again. So um, you want to use the SGD procedure to fit the logic regression model. And in fact, last lecture, we saw that the gradient rule is kind of the same as linear regression. So in fact, there's a question here, uh, what is the, um, you know, do we need to write a new gradient function? Um, what we, what's new here is we're going to do a certain, uh, you know, variation of logic regression uh, where we, we're going to add what is called a regularization term. Okay. So we're going to add regularization. That's going to change the gradient function. Okay. So you need to have a new gradient function, which takes a gradient with respect to the data part, which is the, you know, you know, the loss function, loss part, but there's also going to be a gradient with respect to the regularizer. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, we did not look at ridge regression, which is a regularized version of least squares. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll comment on this during lecture as well. So regularization just means you have the original uh, loss, squared loss, for example, in the ridge regression case, you add an, you give an additive term, that additive term doesn't depend on data. Okay? It's just a preference that you have on the theta parameter or the theta vector. Your preference is that, hey, the theta vector, uh, I don't like theta vectors which have large two norm uh, square, okay? so for, for example, right? Uh, so that's your preference. Uh, so uh, so that preference is, is what's called a regular, regularization term. And uh, in fact, the two norm square is exactly what is called L2 penalty. And uh, uh, you generally penalize all the parameters except for the intercept. So for example, if you have theta naught, theta one, theta two, uh, then you ignore theta naught and then just, just uh, take the two norm square of theta one and theta two. Okay, uh, that vector. Okay, so two-dimensional vector. So uh, basically, third part is just asking, uh, define this, you know, change the gradient function, and hopefully the gradient function can also have a parameter, uh, an input which says whether to use the gradient or not. Okay, so, uh, you know, when you don't use the gradient, it should be the original elastic regression. If you use a gradient L2, L2 regularization, then the gradient should take that into account while computing the gradient. Okay, so that's all. Um, there are a bunch of subparts in this question which deal with model diagnostics and uh, uh, hopefully we will see uh, uh, some in initial forays into model diagnostics. So the first one is just a function which computes what is called the confusion matrix. Okay, so think of binary classification setting, which is what we saw last time. We have a bunch of uh, predictions of class one versus class two and a bunch of real values. Okay, what should be class one, what should be class two in, in the data? they should ideally match. Okay. If, if they match exactly, then you have literally zero error, right? Uh, confusion matrix is just uh, uh, trying to take into account, hey, when was it? When was the ground truth, let's say class one, and when, you know, when did you say class one, and when did you say class two? So there'll be basically four numbers that you'll compute. So that's called a confusion matrix. Um, the, uh, you know, here the question is just asking, write this confusion matrix and, and use that uh, as part of your, uh, two models that you're going to build. Okay, what are the two models? One model without regularization, the other model with regularization. Both you'll build using your own SGD plus grain function that you've defined. Okay. Uh, any questions up to this point? I don't want to run through this uh, too quickly, but anything that kind of sticks out as unclear? Chat. Um, okay, so uh, there's a notion of a test data. So just think of test data for us. We've not really very formally talked about test data and so on. Maybe in today's lecture, we'll talk about it. Uh, but you can see that out of the thousand, uh, you know, 1,100 rows, that there's a bunch of rows which are kind of set aside for kind of reporting results, uh, which is what we're just calling it test data here. And so you want to, um, plot the losses 
uh, as a function of epoch. So that's where your SGD and your SGD, which had that return, right? It was returning. Uh, uh, if it was not returning losses, you should make it return losses as well, in addition to the iterate. Uh, so, you know, you can plot these losses, okay, both on the training as well as test and see whether, you know, whether things, whether you're overfitting on the, on those, uh, on the overfitting with respect to the data or not. Okay. Um, so, so there'll be basically two losses per model. And so total two, two loss curves per model. And so there'll be four curves for the two models. Um, yeah, and so once you do that, you know, now you have really built a logic regression model literally from scratch. You trained it from your own uh, functions that you've written. Now you wanna just compare uh, uh, these models with the corresponding uh, model that you can just invoke from scikit-learn, right? So scikit-learn has a, um, you know, logic regression. In fact, if you look at the function definition in this doc, and don't be hesitant to read this documentation. Uh, in fact, among the Python documentation, if you want to read some documentation, it should be generally pandas, numpy, and maybe scikit-learn are maybe in the top are probably in the top three. So don't be hesitant to look at them. Uh, you can see, you know, what does it do? So it's it's a uh, classifier, and you can see what inputs it'll take. And in fact, this is the type of input that was also we defined for the gradient function, for example. Right. So use this use this to build the logic regression model now. And then compare with uh, you know what did you get when you built from your own uh, uh, code base, right? Um, and the last few functions are just uh, trying to now look at hey, is it sensitive to what choices you made? For example, the learning rate of your gradient descent uh, procedure, uh, or the regularization coefficient that you chose. Chose for example, you might have chosen something before, uh, and then you know the fit is very different from the fit that you've gotten if you use scikit learn. You can try out try to change these things to see if your if your numbers are close. Okay. And so this is a little bit open-ended, uh, question number eight. Um, question number nine is again asking a, to create, write a function which is very similar to uh, the confusion matrix function. Okay, It's basically just two inputs, uh, predicted uh, classes and true classes. And uh, you can compute what is called X score. So you can read the definition in the, in the Wikipedia uh, link here. Uh, it's a simple function. So it's, this is just writing of a function uh, and then use uh, the F score uh, to kind of uh, uh, build a bunch of models. Okay, so last question is actually just rerunning uh, some of the thing that you've done before, except now we are choosing the features that should be input. Okay, so, so far till question nine, there was no suggestion of which features to use. So use whatever you want to use. I mean, including all of them, if you want. Uh, uh, actually, you can actually let me briefly mention. Uh, You can actually just see the uh, data set, right? This is a very small data set. So you can see most, you know, most of the features are just numerical, okay? except for the last thing, which is a class. So you can use all of them. And the last question is just asking, what if you only use one of them, or you know, only one input feature, like lag j? So you know, it's basically go going to be something like a simple regression si situation. It's not regression, but just one feature trying to predict the class. Okay, uh, and you want to kind of. Um, yeah, so, so based on that, can you uh, suggest if one of these models is better or how do these models compare to the previous two models that you've trained? Okay. Uh, finally, the last question is about uh, a new uh, model diagnostics. So we are really venturing into model diagnostics, but with the model that we kind of very familiar, familiar with, which is logic regression. Uh, the, uh, the model diagnostic tool here, it's called a rock curve, receiver operator characteristics curve. Um, it's, it's a way to, uh, visualize how well your model is doing at uh, different uh, uh, basically thresholds. So remember this logic regression model actually produces a probability of being class one or class zero. Okay, so it produces a number. Now you get, you get to choose a threshold. I think in, in question three, we already suggested a threshold, uh, you know, 0.5. Okay, so, so if the probability is greater than 0.5, you suggest class one and probability less than 0.5, you suggest class zero. Instead of 0.5, if you choose different, different thresholds, uh, then that will lead to different accuracies. Okay, um, so that's what ROC curve essentially is a curve of confusion matrices uh, at different different thresholds. Okay? Different different thresholds lead to different different confusion matrices, um, and uh, and so look at the link to kind of see what the definition is, uh, uh, and so you can write this function and then use the ROC uh, plot the ROC curves for models that you have. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the that's the goal for question four. So it's mostly just a exercise in plotting. Uh, computing ROC curves, which as I said, if you already have the confusion matrix, it's just a question of choosing different thresholds and then you can get the uh, log curve value at each threshold value. And uh, and then you can, when it says determine the best model, the model, best model would be the one with the highest AUC value. Okay. AUC is just the area under that rock curve. Rock curve is only spans between zero to one on the x-axis. So you have a curve uh, like that. And so what is the area under that curve uh, is what you wanna, uh, based on that you can, um, you can decide which is the best model. Okay. So um, there's a reference implementation, of course, in scikit-learn. Uh, in fact, it'll tell you how to uh, it'll tell you how to compute the compute uh, compute these uh, the values that you want to plot at different thresholds. So you can choose thresholds, for example, the fine grain between zero to one. At every threshold, you can compute uh, if, you know false positive rate and true positive rate, and then you can plot them. Okay, so that's what will give you the curve. Uh, so if, if you're confused, look at the reference implementation, uh, that'll help you. And so that's the fourth question. It's just a exercise. So what's going on in this, in this assignment is mostly really doubling down on, an, on logic regression using stuff that you've built before, which is KNNs, decision trees, and uh, uh, SGD procedure uh, in particular. And using a couple of new tools. One is confusion, three, three new tools, confusion matrix, an F-score uh, function, and an ROC function. Okay, so there's three things. ROC is just based on, if you have a confusion matrix calculator, you can just use that to define, uh, build your ROC function. Okay. Um, so, and then a little bit of plotting. So it's just model diagnosis uh, exercise. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, there is a question, which is a direct message. Okay. So the question is, uh, so try not to send direct messages, first of all, uh, but the question is about there is dependency on some people doing some parts of the assignment and, and they'll have to redo it and so on. I think this is a issue with, if somebody you know implemented SGD for you last time, you should be comfortable in extending that, okay? So it's not like you, are, you don't know what's going on in assignment one or two or, you know, you should be, if not the details of the internals of how the function was implemented, you should know what the input outputs are and use them, okay? Uh, that level of, uh, uh, comfort, you know, comfort you should have. Okay, first of all, the ideal situation is you should know each of these by yourself. Okay, even the implementations that you can, you know, submitted uh, in assignment one or two. But I would suggest, uh, you know, if not, get up to speed there. What data set are we going to use per question? So there's only. Uh, okay. So there's a question uh, from Anna, which is uh, what data set are we gonna use for question three? It's clear, right? So it's, it literally starts with the data set, weekly data set. Question four is actually using the same, uh, you know, you don't care about the data set actually, you just care about the, uh, I mean, okay. So good question. So it's actually the same data set. Uh, and in particular, you also wanna retain those models that you have, okay? So it's not just the um, questions, but also, sorry, it's not just the models, but also the data set, yeah. In particular, the training data, sorry, the training data set as well as the test data set from, from question three. Okay, it's the same data set. Um, drop me an email and I can update it and add a, add a note there. Um, yeah. Okay, so any anything else? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So when is the TA office hours? Sorry. So it's on Mondays, I think just after the class. Uh, think, um,
Okay, so I want to uh, get started on the place where we left off last time, which is uh, we were talking about using, I mean, we had, brief, we had just defined what is called exponential family. And, uh, um, and, and then we were talking about a template for a generalized linear model. Okay, so um, I, wanna, I don't want to use slides uh, up to this point, but I want to briefly mention that uh, we saw the logistic regression. Okay, and we've seen linear regression for a couple of sessions uh, before. So both of them are examples of generalized linear models or just uh, members of generalized linear models. Okay. So they exhibit some, you know, something similar between them, which is the conditional probability of Y given X and the parameter theta. Okay. So that conditional probability is equal to some G of theta transpose X. Okay. In the linear regression case, the G was a, there was no G function. It was just an identity function. And so conditional probability of y given x was just theta transpose x. It's just literally theta naught plus theta one times x one plus and so on, right? So that linear function. And similarly for the logic regression case, uh, this conditional probability of y, which is class one, let's say, uh, being class one and class two, that was actually uh, equal to g of theta transpose x, where the g function was a sigmoid function. Okay. So there was some similarity like this. So we had this. We assumed that the y's are random variables which has a certain distribution. In fact, in fact, it's going to be an exponential distribution. For linear case, it was the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. For the logistic regression case, it was the binomial, sorry, Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so those two distribution assumptions uh, gave us uh, gave us you know the uh, the conditional probability of y given x to be uh, you know some function of theta and x, and uh, and we saw what what we saw last time was that the gradient descent update rule for logistic regression was essentially the same as the gradient descent operate rule for linear regression model as well. Although the linear regression model has B squares objector, uh, the logistic regression model has a um, maximizing likelihood objective. Okay, So two different objectives and different models because one has a link function, which is uh, or this G function, which is sigmoid and the other one did not have, but they led to similar gradient descent update rule. And so, so those are similarities and uh, that led us to kind of understanding, hey, uh, maybe you know this output uh, output variable y or target variable y can have other distributions. Okay, it doesn't have to be exactly Gaussian, uh, conditionally Gaussian, or it doesn't have to be uh, conditionally Bernoulli. Okay, it can be uh, it can take other distributions. So uh, that led us to kind of define this general template for different distributions. Okay, uh, which means that their density function can assume a form which is shown here. So normal distribution can assume a form like this, and a and Bernoulli uh, distribution can also assume a form like this. And to get to this form, we defined a couple of terms. Okay, so one uh, is, was basically what is the statistic? Statistic we said is just a function of the data. So the original data itself is, a, is also statistic, or a function of the data like an average or sum is also called a statistic. Okay, uh, then we define what is called a sufficient statistic. Okay, sufficient statistic is basically uh, capturing all information that is necessary to kind of uh, estimate the parameter of the distribution generating the, generating the data. Okay, so that's uh, sufficient. And so we were representing the sufficient statistic uh, by the letter T. Okay, so why, uh, so letter T. Um, and so Y is the original data point. Okay, so original random variable. So T of Y is a function of uh, that random variable. So if you had only one random variable, T of Y is a function of that random variable. It could, you could have like a data set which has hundred observations, then T of y1, y2, y3, y100 uh, is, a, is a function, which could be, for example, an average or some like, like that. Okay? So that's called, that's a sufficient statistic. And uh, the distribution um, uh, for a generic y, uh, given this natural parameter eta, uh, looks like this. Okay, It has a function, which doesn't depend on uh, parameters. Okay, uh, Sorry, it doesn't depend on this natural parameter. Sorry. Um, so this uh, is a function which is supposed to be positive, okay? Because at the end of the day, this is uh, a distribution uh, density function, and uh, and then there is a natural parameter eta which interacts with the sufficient statistic in this way. It's an inner product, and uh, the nice thing about exponential family is that the uh, dimensionality of this um, natural parameter eta is the same as the uh, dimensionality of the sufficient statistic. Okay, so you so for example you may only need one sufficient statistic to be able to reverse engineer a parameter. If it's a univariate distribution like a Bernoulli, 
it's one sufficient statistic is enough. But think of a Gaussian distribution. It has a mean and a variance that you want, you might want to estimate. That means you may need to have two sufficient statistics. Okay. So two, as in like a sufficient statistic, statistic here, T could be univariate or it could have it could be a vector. Okay. For example, with the same data, you could compute, for example, uh, the sample mean or sample variance. Okay. For example, so that could be two numbers. And so, um, natural parameter it turns out for exponential families is the same dimensionality as the uh, uh, sufficient statistic dimension. So that's why you can do an inner product. Okay. So uh, exponential family uh, distributions conform to this form. Okay. So they have this, this expression. And the last expression, last term, which is just a function of only the natural parameter, is just a, is just a function that is added in as a, as a way to just ensure that the original thing is a original thing is a dis distribution function. Sorry, original thing is a density function or a probability mass function which integrates or sums to one. Okay, so it's just a thing is such that you know it's like a normalizing constant such that it doesn't depend on y, so it doesn't depend on what value the random variable takes, but such that it's a you know it's it's it's, it's a function such that uh, the overall, for example, if y is a discrete random variable, then if you sum over y, then you should sum to one, right? So you need that, so that's why there's an extra function here. So long story short, the idea is that any um, uh, not any, but a bunch of uh, distributions that we are aware of, like uh, normal distribution or the Bernoulli or even binomial, they all belong to this family. So if you actually look at Wikipedia's uh, entry for exponential family, you'll see a table with 30 different distributions. Okay? I don't want to mention all of them, uh, but there are a lot of distributions. Okay, So that gives you a lot of flexibility in uh, different types of Ys that you'll see. For example, if you just look at a histogram of uh, y or the target variable in your data okay they may they will not look normal okay so they may look for example if they are sales data they certainly are definitely not going to be less than zero okay they could even look like a, uh like a, if you have counts then they may have like an exponentially decaying uh, type of histogram okay so those don't correspond to for example bernoulli or the normal distribution but they could correspond to some other distributions in exponential family and that may uh, kind of hint you towards using a glm model rather than Using linear regression or uh, or logic regression or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I didn't want to use all the slides to just mention that, but what we did last time was to get to this point where we said there's a sufficient statistic. Using the sufficient statistic and the natural parameter, we can define a family of density functions. Okay, or family of probability mass functions. Uh, which have this functional form, which where there's a base measure, there's a natural parameter, there's a sufficient statistic, and there is a log partition function. Okay. These are just names for them, but they're just, these are common, B of Y, T of Y, and A of eta, and eta itself. Okay. This, you know, any distribution which kind of can be recast into this is a, is a member of this family. And uh, GLMs are built on top of this backbone. Okay, GLM is just a collection of, uh, uh, Models, okay, which are uh, built on built on top of distribution as a distributional assumption, which is basically you need to be a member of the exponential family. Okay, now some people may be wondering, hey, how is this related to uh, uh, like why are we spending so much time on GLMs, for, for example, and how is it related to some other models that we've seen, like KNN uh, in the first lecture or the decision tree in the second lecture, and so on. Um, I would say that these models are uh, really uh, driven by our probabilistic assumption about the random variables involved, in particular the output random variable, because that's the, that's the random variable that we care about. The output random variable y, we're making an assumption that y is conditionally normal, okay, in the in the linear regression case, or y is uh, conditionally Bernoulli in in the logic logistic regression case. So we are making a distributional assumption about our data, and if you're making that assumption, uh, then might as well use the Suitable since you're making a some distribution assumption, you want to use the distribution property to kind of fit the model. Right? I mean, why make an assumption when you're not going to use that? Like, for example, if you're going to use a decision tree to build to build your classifier, you're not making any distribution assumption. Okay. Uh, for example, or if you're using KNNs, you're not making any distribution assumption. Right? But here we're making an assumption. What does making an assumption fetch us? Uh, it can fetch uh, several things. First of all, interpretability. Okay. Uh, second thing is you're making an assumption, which means that that's that's a domain knowledge. Okay. That's not derived from data. I mean, uh, that's not different data. So that means you are imposing a bias, which means that you may not need as much data to get to your model in case it is true that the data cor corresponds to your distribution assumption. Okay. So if it is actually true that uh, condition, you know, y condition on x and theta is actually linear, 
Okay, if it's actually true, then you need uh, maybe hundred observations to actually fit get the thetas. But if you ignore that and you want to use, for example, the KNN to estimate, you know, K KNN to kind of give you y's for different values of x's, then you may need more data to be as good as uh, you know this linear model. Okay, so linear model is actually what you're getting is uh, on the spectrum of things you are making some assumption. In fact, data data specific assumption about the output random variable, and so that gets you sample efficiency and also interpretability. Okay, and that's why a lot of people like linear models. Uh, where you can interpret, uh, you know, uh, uh, coefficients at least partially. Okay, and uh, but you know, there's also a caveat that interpretability. We should not make causal claims about, uh, uh, you know, that uh, if one of the features is actually making uh, is actually causally related to the output variable. So just that caveat, uh, not just with linear models, but other types of models. Yeah, uh, we haven't seen causal claims, uh, but as I said. The whole of machine learning, or at least this course, is primarily considered concerned with uh, associations. Okay, features are associated with uh, outputs taking some value. Okay, y. So x and y, uh, they are associated with each other. Okay, at least uh, in terms of the our uh, statistical slash probabilistic perspective. Uh, anyway, so uh, kind of uh, spend a uh, bunch of time in this slide. So what I wanted to do next is build models. Uh, mention uh, talk about building models. Uh, that predicts uh, a random output. So we are really assigning randomness, uh, basically calling the output variable now a random variable, right? So we've been doing that since uh, uh, linear regression's probabilistic perspective uh, as a function of x. And for example, this y need not be just normally distributed, which was the case in linear, linear regression. So we can say, hey, what if y is uh, Poisson distributed? Okay, so it's a count, count, uh, it's counts in a period of time, for example. So we can do, for example, Poisson regression, uh, if you understand uh, the GM, GLM recipe, okay, generalized linear modeling recipe. Okay, So it really depends on what assumption you want to make on the output random variable. Um, so the recipe is, you, you've, been, you've, been given, uh, you've been given the context, which is, hey, you want to do regression or classification. And of course, you know, as is with supervised learning, you want to predict y given x. right? Um, the assumption we're going to mostly make on the output random variable and trying to also say that uh, the output random variable has a distribution, and that distribution is is uh, is such that it uh, is actually the distribution is a member of the exponential family. And so then there's going to be an, a template that you can just use. And in fact, the template is um, as, as it, we'll see. Um, okay, so let me mention what assumptions we're making. Okay, so we as I was saying, we we're going to make a distribution assumption, and that has to be a part of the exponential family. So you can see that, uh, for example, y given conditional probability of y. For logistic case was Bernoulli. We, we said it is, you know, we're going to assume that it's Bernoulli. Okay. And so in general, we're going to say y conditional on x and, and the, you know, maybe uh, user parameter or uh, parameter theta, like uh, uh, the theta we've been seeing, like theta runs for x. So y given uh, x and, and theta is, is belongs to an exponential family. Okay. So that's the general assumption. That's the template. Okay. So we specialized it to Bernoulli or Gaussian in the logistic regression slash linear regression case. Okay. And instead of uh, Bernoulli, you can say, hey, which exponential family? Maybe Poisson distribution, maybe log normal distribution, maybe some, you know, there are many names. Uh, as I said, you go look at the Wikipedia entry for uh, exponential family, there are so many distributions you can pick. Okay. Um, so you're going to first make this assumption that, hey, uh, distribution, conditional distribution is it belongs to exponential family. Uh, the second assumption is uh, related to. Um, the conditional probability of the outcome given uh, given uh, uh, the x and theta. So okay, this so first one is already making an assumption about the distribution of y. The second one is uh, talking about the uh, con the expectation of the random variable. So if, if you already tell me the distribution, the expectation is also kind of known. But what assumption we're going to make is that the this expectation is related to uh, are the function that we care about. So H theta of X is this conditional probability, okay? In fact, you're gonna say H theta of X is the conditional probability of the sufficient statistic, okay? Uh, given X and theta. So this is an assumption you're gonna make. And of course, this uh, assumption, uh, if T of Y is equal to Y, which is the case for uh, Bernoulli, for example, then, you know, H theta of X is just the conditional probability of Y given X, okay? So this is an assumption you're gonna make. And, the last assumption is how is eta? So, so uh, how is eta related to theta? 
Okay, how is uh, this natural parameter the exponential family related to theta? Remember, there are two things going on. One is the exponential family, which is parameterized beta, but the other thing is we we want to have this linear uh, linear relationship, like uh, theta runs for x type of an expression. Okay, so typically, for example, for linear regression, we saw theta runs for x, h of theta is equal to theta runs for x, and for logic regression, we saw some extra gene in the front. So what we want to say is that eta is actually equal to theta runs for x. Okay, so now we are relating eta and and this this theta. Okay, so theta, which uh, is a parameter that we're gonna optimize, right? Uh, the way we optimize for linear regression, the way we optimize for logic regression, we're just saying that eta is gonna be equal to theta runs for x, and uh, y is an exponential family parameters by eta, and h theta of x is a uh, is the conditional expectation of the summation set. Okay, so those are the three uh, assumptions we're gonna make. Um, any questions here? Yeah. How do we decide uh, which assumption of the family are we is, is there a way to decide? Or... Oh, which family? So, with a with a given data set, you're gonna just try to see whether a particular univariate distribution fits. Uh, typically, univariate distribution fits uh, fits your output. Like for example, if output is literally sales or some counts of events then a Poisson regression would be better. So you would say the exponential family distribution there should be a Poisson distribution. Based on the initial ADM, we say to so distribution. Just a Y, yeah. Y is the only random variable here, right? Okay, with the y. Based on that, we decide from the exponential family which of the some other should be like if it's if it's or worships or any other. Yes, but the, okay, so let me backtrack that a bit. Uh, so this, it's hard to do EDA to and directly say whether Y is distributed appropriately because it's actually conditional probability of y given x okay. so uh, um, so this is actually the distribution is not like you decide the distribution after you look at the data this is a domain knowledge so that's why i think goes back to my previous point so you are actually imposing you know you you have the data from which you can say you know how x is related to y using for example knn or addition tree there you're not making any assumption now you're going to add an extra assumption saying hey i want to say that y is actually you know, you know, maybe there's a name for the Y column and it says sales, then you know that it's not gonna be negative, for example, maybe Gaussian distribution is not the right uh, distribution, things like that. So then you say, I'm gonna assume that the conditional probability of Y given X is uh, a certain distribution. Okay, um, sorry about the, uh, so this is an assumption that you need to make. And, and same thing with, uh, so this is an assumption that the conditional expectation of uh, the, the sufficient statistic is, is related to this H function. Uh, which where we have what the search function is actually just think of it as G of theta transpose X. So what we, what's, what's, what you need to decide is the G here. Okay. And third one is just, uh, you know, the natural parameter of the distribution that you assume is related to uh, theta as uh, eta is equal to theta transpose X. Um, so these are just assumptions, I would say at this point. So given that, um, Okay, so let's, uh, you know, remarks which we just went through. Uncertainty is modeled by a well-known distribution. So exponentially fam exponential family members are actually well-known distributions. Okay, exponential distribution, Poisson distribution, all the types of distributions you might have seen in IDS 570, for example, uh, most of them will belong to this family. Um, so, uh, and uh, H theta of X is actually a prediction of uh, your uh, output, right? Prediction of output. So. Uh, it should be, you know, it should be related to conditional expectation over your distribution. And in fact, it should be something like this, a conditional expectation of your sufficient statistic. Okay. Um, and uh, natural parameter is related linearly to this theta, this theta parameter. Okay. So those are three assumptions. Um, so the, under these assumptions, you can have a template. Okay. So which template literally is, you know, you just choose a distribution. That's the main ingredient. So uh, we already seen the template for linear regression and logic regression separately, but let's look at uh, through the lens of uh, this GLM template. Okay, so um, so so in linear regression case, y is h theta is equal to theta and x natural. Okay, so so remember assumption uh, two is where we need to decide g. That's the only thing we did not say. Assumption, assumption one said, you know, conditional, conditional expectation of y given x should be should belong to the exponential family. We, in linear regression case, we already say it's a conditionally Gaussian anyway. 
And the third assumption is just saying eta is related to theta in a, in a linear fashion. So the only thing is like, what is G? And the G here is, is, is nothing. It's a unity function, unit function, sorry, identity function. Uh, so hash theta of uh, X is equal to theta transpose with X is natural because uh, output variable is continuous. And in fact, Y given X is exactly uh, with some, uh, is exactly normal. Uh, in fact, normal with some mean and uh, some fixed variance. Okay, so that fixed variance, you can just assume to be, let's say unit variance. So, so because that sigma is actually not a part of your optimization or it doesn't come up, okay? So you can say that uh, we are actually assuming that Y is uh, normally distributed some with some mean and uh, some fixed variance, okay? It doesn't have to be one, but some fixed variance. Okay, so, so, we, so which is exactly what, what I've written here. So sigma square, you can just assume to be equal to one. Then if you think of the conditional probability, right? So generally, so if Y is, normally distributed, then this is the expression, right? This is the density function for the Gaussian distribution, for one dimensional Gaussian distribution. Now here, uh, we say we can, we know that this can be written in terms of an exponential family, okay? So what we did is just pluck out the terms related to, uh, uh, you know, take some terms which are only dependent on y, okay? That was a b of y term in the exponential family expression. Uh, take the term which uh, depends on uh, this Nash, this uh, I guess user parameter mu. Uh, so mu times y is like your um, uh, eta, eta, eta transpose t of y. And then the last term doesn't depend on y. It's like the normalizing uh, log partition function. Okay. So it's just a matching of uh, matching of uh, parts of this expression to the exponential family ex expression that you have. Okay. So which is exactly this. So matching is eta should be basically like mu. And T of Y is exactly Y here. There's no transpose, it's one dimensional. Uh, and then uh, this uh, log partition function is exactly half of mu square. Uh, yeah, half of mu square. And B of Y is just everything which doesn't depend on uh, mu. Okay. Uh, so, so given this, this uh, given this, that mu is actually equal to eta. And we said in assumption three that eta should be equal to theta transpose X. Okay. Uh, that gives you a sense that why h of h theta of x is actually theta transpose x is natural because you know um, because of these two properties eta is equal to mu and t of y is just y so not, then the sufficient statistic is actually y itself and if you had multiple observations it will be like some average or some average or sum of y's okay. yeah so I mean dimensionality is one uh, right this is univariate distribution uh, so. Yeah, since Gaussian is an exponential family, h theta of x is this. Uh, h theta of x by assumption two should be this. And t of y we just saw in the previous slide is just y, right? An expectation of y given x given x and theta is, is just mu because y is a normally distributed random variable with mean mu. So mean is mu and mu is equal to eta. We just saw that in the previous uh, slide and eta we, by assumption three is just uh, a theta transpose x. Okay, so that's why h theta of x is equal to theta transpose x. What are, what are you doing here, right? So instead of getting lost in the weights, this slides are just saying that the link function is just a identity function. Okay. Uh, normal distribution is, is an exponential family. Okay, nothing more. Any questions about this? So the muzzle that is getting exercised throughout these slides is actually, and it's important, is actually related to uh, basic probability, right? Uh, so, so we had a prereq calculus, linear algebra and probability. So we are really using uh, certain expressions like uh, conditional expectation or the distribution density function definition and so on, right? So, uh, and we are using it very quickly here. And so try to, and this is, I guess this is, a place where you can kind of exercise that muscle. Okay. This uh, familiarity with uh, distributions and, and being able to say conditional expectation, expectation and so on. And also we are using linear algebra. We have been using, instead of like spelling out the theta, theta transpose x, we can just, uh, we are just using, sorry, spelling out this expression of h theta. We are just using uh, short forms, right? Okay, so I just mentioned this. I'm gonna skip the two colored points because we just saw how h theta of x should be equal to linear here. Uh, similarly, for logic regression, um, output variable was y, which for, for in, in the canonical case, the output variable class will, if there are two classes, one of the class will, will say is zero and the other class is one. 
that makes life easy. Okay, so if if you instead of zero and one, if you say one of the classes minus one and one of the classes plus one, then the expressions will all change. Okay, so just to ensure, just to note that here we are going to say one of the classes zero, the other class is one, uh, and uh, and so p of y, which means if y is Bernoulli, y given the natural parameter p. Okay, uh, sorry, y given the um, uh, user parameter phi okay this is the expression that you know so phi is like the bias of the coin okay phi is the bias of the coin phi is again a greek symbol uh then the probability of y we just saw this is a nice form where if y happens to be one then probability you know bias is exactly phi and if y is zero then the only second term survives right and if you just uh, rearrange again very similar to trying to map it back to the exponential family expression and then you apply an exponential and a log operation okay you know it's redundant but you apply it so that you can get an expression which involves uh, something like log of phi by one minus phi times y, and then a log partition function. Okay, so there is no base uh, b of y here in the front. So basically, what we are trying to say is that this this log of phi of one phi by one minus phi is your natural parameter. Okay, so we just so this expression is just trying to show that Bernoulli belongs to the exponential family. Okay, so there's not much going on here, and uh, Bernoulli is exponential family. Then what should be the link function? Okay, that's the only missing thing. The link function h theta of x, we said is should be equal to, uh, by second assumption of GLM, we should, should be equal to the conditional expectation of the sufficient statistic. Sufficient statistic for this case, you, you see that is just exactly equal to y itself, right? So that's t of y is y. And by the way, if, if, if you ever, you don't have to remember this, uh, you can go to exponential family uh, Wikipedia page. It just shows you for each distribution, what the sufficient statistic is, what's the, uh, what base measure is, what um, uh, log partition function is, and all that. Okay. So sufficient statistic is the same as y. So so h theta of uh, x is equal to expectation of y. And expectation of y is just one times the probability of being in one class plus zero times the probability of being in second class. Okay, and so zero times you know something else doesn't matter. And so what is the probability of y is equal to one given x x comma theta? Okay, uh, that is exactly equal to one by uh, one plus e to the power minus um, theta transpose x. Okay, so that's why h theta of x is something like this. Therefore, the link function is that sigmoid function, and uh, theta transpose x we know is 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 exactly as before. Okay. Um, yeah. So what we determine is h theta of x is this, has this link function. Now, if you change, so with these two examples, you can imagine if you change it to let's say Poisson uh, random variable or some other random variable, you just have to figure out what is this h theta of x okay you maybe have you know maybe a fancy expression and that may depend on the distribution that you assumed about y okay that's it uh, nothing else is going on okay so now let's talk about uh, multiple classes and now this is a uh, departure from uh, so departure from our previous treatment with logic regression which is mostly focused on the binary case okay so y is equal to zero or one okay two class classification now you want to say, hey, what happens uh, when you have multiple classes? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that y takes a y is a, a random variable which is uh, determined by a categorical distribution. Okay. So what is a categorical distribution? It's a distribution that uh, takes k values. So something like a, like for example, if you throw a die. It, take, it can take a value from one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So it can take six values instead of just two, right? So uh, rest of the treatment is very similar. So, um, so Bernoulli distribution, uh, which was what is backing the binary case, had one parameter, phi. Okay, one parameter is the probability of observing the class one. Okay. Uh, whereas for the uh, categorical distribution, there's going to be one uh, vector parameter. Okay, so one vector parameter where each coordinate is a probability of observing one of these classes. Okay. So, so if there are six uh, classes, there's going to be six numbers. Okay. And that's kind of expected, right? Just think of PMF with a support, which are six numbers. Okay. There's only, you know, probability one sixth number is equal to one, probability one sixth number is equal to two, and so on. Right. So you need one number per uh, pro observing one of the outcomes. Okay. So number of parameters in the Bernoulli case is one, number of parameters in, in the Categorical distribution case is actually not k, but k minus one, and that's because you know these numbers have to sum up to one. So if you know five of the numbers, then the sixth number is determined, right? If you if you remember, if you have a die which takes six values, 
if I tell you what's the probability of outcome for each of the five values, then you, you know what the probability of outcome for the uh, last value is, right? It's just one minus the probability of whatever these other outcomes are, okay? Um, and, and just like what we did in a kind of a, a convenient notation for the condition, the convenient, convenient notation for the probability of the random variable, you know, this, instead of writing if y is equal to y, y is equal to one, then it's p, if y is equal to zero, then it's one minus p. Instead of writing like six, five cases or six cases here, you can again do the same thing, a short form where probability of y can be written as p, p1 to the power indicator of whether y is equal to one or not, times p2 to the power indicator of whether y is equal to two or not. Okay, it's just a short form. Okay, it's like literally if then else condition where y is equal to one, then report, you know, return p1, if y is equal to two, return p2 and so on. Okay, so that's what is the short form here where these p's are just coordinates of the categorical distribution and the sum of one, okay? Um, actually, I didn't check the chat. Okay, where this this notation, I think we've seen it when we talked about KNNs, uh, for the, when, you know, back when we were talking about KNNs, it's just an indicator, okay? So it's like, it evaluates the true when the thing inside the curly braces is true. Uh, evaluates to one if the thing inside the curly base is true. If thing inside the curly base is not true, then it evaluates to zero. Okay. So, uh, in fact, the thing inside the curly base is, is y. So y is a random variable, and so this function, indicator function, is also a random variable. Okay. A function of a random variable is a random variable, right? So if y is a random variable, indicator of whether y is equal to one is also a random variable, okay. and that's why you can write an expression like this, which is expectation of that indicator of y is equal to one. Uh, y is equal to i given p. Okay, uh, you can write an expression like this. Uh, I think this given p is a little bit uh, informally written here uh, because p is a fixed unknown quantity for us, so you don't have to write given p here. But uh, so, what is the expectation of this random variable? It's exactly equal to p i. Okay, it's just uh, for each coordinate. It's just saying uh, each coordinate, the probability of the coordinate, you know, y taking value i is just given by p i. It's like a Bernoulli for that coordinate. Any, any questions about Bernoulli versus categorical? Uh, it's just uh, trying to put these two distributions next to each other and talk about them. Um, categorical is also related to another distribution called the multinomial distribution. Okay. So uh, just like Bernoulli is related to a distribution called the binomial distribution, categorical distribution is related to something called multinomial. Okay. So there are four distributions going on, but let's just focus on these two, uh, Bernoulli and categorical. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, so we needed that definition of categorical because multi-class logic regression is, you know, is making an assumption about output being categorical. Okay, uh, because we have multiple classes, so we have to have output which is categorical. So uh, after uh, computations that you know very similar to how we can do the JLM template for linear regression and uh, logic regression by Bernoulli case, sorry, the, the uh, binary logic regression case we can get, uh, uh, so we'll have the user parameters P1, P2, P3, and P4, let's say, uh, if the number of classes is four, then these are the three parameters and the fourth parameter is determined, okay? One minus the remaining. Natural parameters, uh, they're gonna be, uh, again, very similar to the previous case, eta one, eta two, eta three, uh, and eta four is equal to zero, okay? So this is just trying to map the categorical back into, in, into the uh, exponential family template. Then if you do that, then you'll see that eta one, eta two, eta three are the parameters and eta four is zero. And uh, uh, the hypothesis parameters, theta one, theta two, theta three, those are the three parameters, uh, sorry, uh, hypothesis parameters are such that each parameter itself is a vector. Okay, so now this is a you know, non-trivial jump here uh, where each theta one, theta two and theta three, they are hypothesis parameters in the sense that they determine the H theta function. Remember, there's a H theta function that we ultimately want to know what is the link function is for that. That H theta uh, will have parameters, okay? Uh, theta one, theta two, theta three, but these are now vectors, okay? These are vectors. Okay? And each vector is of dimension N, which is the number of uh, features, okay? Or number of features plus one extra, which is the theta naught, for example. So one extra like uh, bias uh, parameter. So one extra bias parameter, yeah. So each one is a vector. 
and we assume that the last theta vector uh, for the let's say the last class is is zero, a zero vector. Okay, and so the conditional probability of y given uh, so conditional probability of y taking a specific value i uh, given x and theta, it depends on so if you write it in terms of natural parameters, it looks like this. So it's either e to the power eta i divided by sum over j is equal to one to k, which is at k classes, four classes of e to the power eta i. Okay, so it's it's this function is called a softmax function. You will see this function uh, if you're doing, uh, for example, deep learning later. Okay. It's just a very similar to, uh, it's actually related to the sigmoid function. Okay. I don't want to show the relationship right now, but this is a very similar expression. Okay. So this is just a, a call a softmax function. It's e to the power something divided by a bunch of terms, which also are e to the power something. Okay. Now h theta of x, okay, h theta of x is actually a vector. Okay. It's going to produce uh, if you have four classes, then it's going to produce three numbers. Okay. It's going to produce three numbers. And uh, what, are the, what, should, what are each of the three numbers? It's just e to the power. It's exactly this. Okay, So remember, h theta of x, what is it trying to produce? Okay. If you have four classes, you want to produce the probability of being in class one, probability of being in class two, probability of being in class three, and probability of being in class four. Okay, But we said that, hey, there's no need to separately compute probability of being in class four, because if I tell you the first three probabilities, the fourth one is just one minus the first three. Right? So the first coordinate of h theta of x is just trying to produce the probability of being in class one. And we just said, you know, probability of being in class one, uh, for example, it has this function form. Class three also has this function form, and class three also has this function form. But, and we also said, according to GLM assumption, that eta uh, should be a linear function. Okay, so eta, for example, if eta is equal to theta transpose x, eta one should be equal to theta one transpose x. Okay. And so these are just uh, sigmoid functions with three different. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, with uh, three different theta vectors, okay. so theta one, theta one, theta three. Okay, and, and the denominator has um, yeah, the denominator has uh, needs all all the four. Uh, Yeah, the denominator has the sum over k, but then the last term is actually zero. So, so it's like one plus j is equal to one to k minus one, something like that. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that for j is equal to k, uh, we know that theta four is equal to zero, then it's basically one. Okay, so for that uh, last term, e to the power zero is like one. So, you know, that's kind of a second order point, but basically h theta of x is this. Okay. Looks complicated, but uh, this is the generalization from binary case to the multi uh, multi class case. Okay, so now uh, so we were able to deal with multi class situation with Canons already, right? So there was no issue with multi class and k nearest neighbors. Uh, there's there was no issue with multi class and even uh, addition trees. Okay, but then we moved to linear models, uh, and in linear models we although we started regression, we moved back to classification, and in classification so far we only looked at binary situation. And in fact, in assignment it's going to be binary. But now we again jump back to multi-class situation, and, and this is how uh, you would have you would have parameters. Uh, you have, you'll have one parameter vector corresponding to each class, essentially, with with one extra dimension uh, kind of getting dropped. Okay. Any questions here? Yeah. So let me uh, just summarize. So. Uh, JLMs, uh, mostly just an assumption on the output, uh, the conditional probability of the output variable. Well, if it's not normally distributed uh, with uh, ignoring the second, uh, this second, you know, variance, then H theta is something like this. If it's a conditional distribution is actually Bernoulli, uh, then H theta is just a uh, sigmoid followed by uh, theta transpose X. Or if you want to explicitly, if you want to merge it together, h theta of x is actually one by one plus e to the power minus theta runs with x. That's the that's the that's your function. Okay, uh, it's trying to approximate the probability of being in the uh, being equal to class one, okay. first class. Um, and if you have multi-class classification, then if you assume y to be categorical, uh, then you will have basically k thetas, where the k theta vector is going to be zero, all zeros. Um, and uh, each of the uh, h theta will be itself a vector in k minus one dimensions, uh, which will have each coordinate basically look like uh, something like this. Okay, so it's e to the power uh, that coordinate uh, theta divided by e to the power all the other, uh, so e to the power all the coordinate thetas. Okay. 
not all the other, but all, all coordinate theta's. Okay, so I think uh, we have, uh, so, so we, we're gonna uh, jump over to the next topic, but before that, uh, the key things in GLM is, is, is not too new, but there are some underlying topics we had to come up to speed with to talk about this, which is just make an assumption about what is Y given uh, a conditional probability of Y, okay? uh, which is hopefully that belongs, belongs to the exponential family, that conditional probability. And then assume uh, eta, for example, is uh, assume a linear relationship via the natural parameter. So eta is linearly related to theta and x. Okay. And then uh, under this assumption and uh, the distribution assumption, you just need to compute what is h theta of x. Okay. That may take a form something like this, or uh, each coordinate can take a form something like this. Okay. So, so, but in general, you need to start from what is h theta of x is, is exactly equal to e to the expectation of. Uh, the sufficient statistic given x comma theta. Okay, so that's where you start from, and you get an expression for h theta of x. Okay. And respect of all these choices, the algorithm you really don't have to change anything. Okay. It's, it, it turns out, and, and we saw only for logic case that uh, the update rule is the same. Uh, but if you change it to Poisson or log normal or something else, uh, the update rule is going to be the same. Okay. It'll have a different uh, log likelihood. It'll have a different link function, but the update rule is going to be uh, something like this. It's just a byproduct of this, this choices that we're making. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so if not, let's uh, take a break for uh, 10 minutes and resume. So in terms of complexity of things, uh, linear regression was, you know, you spent a considerable amount of time in assignment two, hopefully that was not uh, too difficult. Logic regression, you're gonna spend some time uh, in assignment three, hopefully by when you get through assignment three, logic regression in the binary case should be, you know, should you, you should know it pretty well. What we have not done in terms of assignment at least is uh, multi-class logic regression. But the difference as I said is mostly instead of estimating one vector theta, you're actually estimating a collection of such theta vectors, okay? Uh, how many such theta vectors should be there? Ideally, there should be four, but because of the redundancy, uh, you basically need three. If, if you're doing a four-class logic, four logic regression, you just need three theta vectors, okay? You could actually maintain four if you want, but it's just the fourth one is redundant. Uh, so so that's, that's the big leap there with the binary versus multi-class, okay? So in fact, if you come back to binary case, you know, binary is not like a very different situation than multi-class multi -class case. Since binary means two classes, there's only one theta vector because the second theta vector is redundant. You could write a version where there could be two, two theta vectors for the binary case. It's just that they you know, don't need two vectors. Okay, that's why there's only one. So that's why if you have a four class, multi -class, four class situation, then the number of theta vectors you could have four or three. Three is the version that we saw in the lectures. Okay. So hopefully that uh, is um, kind of relates that binary is not like a very crazy special case. It's, it's actually just a special case of multi-class. Okay? It's not very different treatment than multi-class okay? uh, because a Bernoulli distribution is a special case of the categorical distribution when the number of outcomes is two. Okay? Uh, so what was kind of probably hard is uh, generalized linear modeling template. Okay, Why exponential family and why the uh, assumptions being made and the assumptions are specifically so that everything else becomes easy. Okay, so where you just need to focus on h theta of x being some link uh, link of a linear 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 function. Okay. So you start with theta transpose x or, or versions of it, and then you do a transformation of them to get h theta of x. Okay, so um, I would suggest uh, I mean it, it did use uh, some probability distributions and uh, expectations. It did use a notion of sufficient statistic. Okay, or in general statistics, it uses a notion of uh, I guess a uh, little bit of linear algebra, uh, right? Uh, uh, we had uh, a little bit of calculus because we sh we showed the exponential families expression. There was like a bunch of functions getting multiplied. Okay, so you should be comfortable with uh, there's a b of y times e to the power 
theta transpose uh, T of y uh, minus alpha times alpha of uh, A of uh, eta. So there's some expression there, right? So that you should be comfortable with writing a function like that. Anyway, um, so reach out to the TA or my office hours if you want a further explanation of this. And of course, see the recording. Uh, perhaps that will clarify uh, if you have any lingering doubts. The first time you see it, it may be challenging, but it's not. It's not. It's actually out of the collection of models. It's just a nice model to have when you care about sample efficiency or interpretability, and you know that data has that distribution. Like you, you know that the conditional probability of y is not normal or it's not uh, banal, but it's some special nice thing that you already know, like sales data or count data, which are non-negative, for example, uh, things like that. Okay. So, the, uh, and for example, returns data in finance. And that's why there's a huge emphasis on such, such linear models and variations there okay, in, in those fields uh, because of interpretability and other nice characteristics. Um, but you know that's like one piece of your models that you know already like KNN slash addition trees and, um, and, and models that we'll see maybe in next lecture like SVMs and so on. So the objective of this class is not exactly recapture all the models that you've seen, for example, in 572 but really drill down on each model and really add some you know, way to communicate these models and considerations of these models in a little bit more formal way. Okay? So just the language that most data scientists or data science analytics professionals should use because otherwise what one person is saying is completely undecipherable to the other person. Okay? Um, so just a learning of the language, which is important here. And doesn't have to be those math symbols. It can be if as long as you can write, you know, what's the consideration, what the nuance is, uh, while while considering model versus model one versus model two, or within the model, why does it have, you know, three theta vectors rather than four theta vectors, for example, in a multi-class logic regression case? You should be able to think through why, right? Um, anyway, so uh, that was just my <laughs> uh, recap com commentary there. Uh, so let me come back to. I'm sharing the screen. So what we did is 04A uh, lecture slide. Um, and uh, now we're gonna move on to model selection, okay, model assessment and model selection. Okay, so the two parts to this. Um, and this is, I guess, related to uh, some of the work that you will do even in assignment three, which is we're gonna say, hey, this model is better than, one model is better than more, other model. Uh, how do we say it? And Actually, maybe not today, but uh, maybe early next lecture, we're gonna talk about cross-validation. Okay. So really, all the cross-validation is a simple idea and we can immediately talk about it in the next 15 minutes. I think it doesn't do justice. So there's so much consideration to talk about, hey, why is cross-validation the right hammer to use, right? You wanna kind of build that understanding and that's what we're gonna to do today. Okay. That's not the only goal, but understand, you know, at least a probabilistic lens, what, what people desire out of models we build. Okay. So why should the model build on training data do well on uh, in the future? So there has to be some implicit assumption. Right? The implicit assumption is that future is going to be similar to the past, right? <laughs> very similar to stock market, right? You, you make an investment, you're hoping that future returns are similar to past returns. So there's, there's those assumptions are what we want to surface here, okay? at least in the next uh, hour or so. So um, we start with uh, this slide. It's just a, a, a teaser slide. It's saying what is the number one failure uh, more when you build machine learning models, if not the number one, one of the top few, right? Uh, it's basically overfitting. Okay, so overfitting, overfitting, overfitting. Basically, building something which does really well on your training data, and you have, you you see really good numbers like accuracy or misclassification error or um, you know the confusion matrix numbers or things like that. And then once you actually deploy it uh, in uh, in a real world situation. It doesn't do it, you know. It doesn't. It's as good as like flipping a coin. Okay? It's just bad, right? So, uh, so that's called overfitting, and we're gonna kind of briefly define, uh, uh, informally define actually um, later on in the later on slides. So, there is a distinction between model selection and uh, uh, learning a model. Okay? So, which is, if you think of, so model selection is about comparing model classes. Okay, it's go going from hey, here's a Logic regression model class, and here's a decision tree model class. Okay, that's model selection okay, between models, between model classes. Sorry, uh, but within the model class, okay, like within the class of logic regression, uh, if you if you pick logic regression model or this, that specification, so the model itself can be uh, you know with some particular theta values or some other theta values. Those are just two different 
models, specific models within their logic regression template. Right? Uh, so what this slide I'm trying to show is that um, these different, when you say different models, you're talking about different uh, hypotheses. Okay, okay. Uh, let me backtrack a second. Sometimes we're talking about different models means different like mission tree versus linear models versus something else. And sometimes you're just talking about within the same specification, you know, a model with parameter one versus model with parameter two. And here in this slide, we're saying they are we are using the word different hypotheses to distinguish that. Okay, so for example, here's a linear model. Here's another linear model. And here's another linear model. Okay, so we're gonna say different hypotheses here. Okay. Sometimes we can refer to it as different models, but they are all in the same model class. It's just linear models, right? But there are three different models, with the, sorry, three different hypotheses with their own performance, right? So for example, this model can, you can see that maybe the square error is gonna be high for this model compared to, uh, compared to this one, yeah. right? So, um, so the question is, we are really uh, within the model class, we want to say, hey, which hypothesis is, is better? Okay. So that's the search problem that we've been doing, like gradient descent and so on. Which we were like saying, hey, here's the template. Let's fix with linear models and figure out what are the best parameters are. Okay. So that's that's the search. Uh, here's a different version. Okay. Here I'm talking about different uh, model classes. Okay, in particular, uh, you'll see that uh, here. Let's stick with polynomial models. Okay, so linear model is one example of a polynomial model. So here is a one dimensional regression problem. The original data is sine x, okay? So over, over the interval zero to one. So it's a sine x uh, function. And uh, so that's shown in green and then uh, some slight noise was added and those are the data points that we have, okay? Now we are asking, um, you know, here's a linear model uh, that's fit to this data, okay? So this model, okay? So a specific hypothesis in the linear models family is being fit. And it's, uh, we are saying that's underfitting the original data. We, we know the original data. So clearly it's not capturing the trend, you know, the, the patterns in the original data. So uh, it's underfitting. And here's a completely different model class. Okay? It's a the class of ninth uh, uh, degree polynomial functions. Okay? It's not a linear model class. It's a different model class. Okay? Within that model class, we're fitting one ninth order uh, or ninth degree polynomial, okay, which has a specific coefficients. One hypothesis in that bigger family of functions, okay. And that function uh, is this red function, okay. It's, it's passing through. I mean, given the blue data points in that range, uh, x comma y, basically one dimensional uh, uh, setting. So we got that function, okay, one of the functions. So this is one function in that uh, polynomial family of functions. We could have slightly different coefficients and it would be a slightly different ninth order polynomial, right? Um, so that's overfitting. So that's uh, overfitting. The, so we chose a bigger model class and we overfit. We chose a smaller model class, the linear model, it's the underfit. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna distinguish between choosing model classes, linear models and ninth order models. I mean, doesn't have to be, but in this example it is. Um, And here is a third order model class from which uh, third order regression, okay, third order regression. And you can see that this one uh, seems to approximate, if, if your, first of all, your class doesn't contain the original original function, the original function sine x. If you think, if you go back to your calculus uh, background, uh, sine x, if you want to write it as a function of x, is a huge, it's an infinite series, right? Uh, but, Within this domain of uh, zero to one, this uh, domain in which you are trying to fit the fit uh, observations, um, the third order third order function is good enough. Okay, the third third order hypothesis within the class of third order polynomials is good enough. I mean, here we are just informally saying it, it's the best fit. Uh, we'll talk about you know fitness and, and so on next uh, few minutes. Uh, so is the is the distinction clear? Like. Different hypothesis within the same model class is what we've been doing so far. Okay, when we're trying to search, for, which is what we're doing by using gradient descent, for example. Comparing model classes, like second, first order uh, regression uh, model is just linear regression uh, in the in the uh, in the one dimensional case. Second order regression, second order models, third order models are just higher order polynomial models for the one dimensional regression. They are just different, different, different model classes. Okay, so if you pick a more complicated or more complicated or more complex uh, model class, you may be overfitting. 
okay and if you pick something which is like very simplistic uh, like first order regression uh, uh, first order model class uh, polynomial function class then you'll be you may be potentially underfitting okay. so i want to distinguish between these two uh, So what we want to do is uh, model selection. So how we want to ensure, we want to figure out which model uh, is, is, the, is the best one okay, or, the, or the better one. Okay. So let's uh, start with, a, uh, again, an illustrative example of uh, overfitting or uh, potentially overfitting uh, or okay, illustrative example where we don't know whether we're overfitting or not. So here's an example. So we have uh, some uh, text, okay? So we have a collection of uh, news articles, 2000 of them. And uh, our goal is to classify whether that text or basically a document, okay, uh, corresponds to, uh, you know, the, if these articles are related to corporate acquisitions or whether they are not, okay, the binary classification setting. Okay. And what we're gonna do is, uh, you know, text, first of all, they are not, not numbers. And so we aren't, we are, so far we, at least in this class, we're not seeing how to treat with treat text. So we'll say, okay, whatever, let's, let's actually figure out the universe of uh, all types of words that can appear in these 2000 documents. Okay, maybe there's 9,900 different uh, words, or maybe there's a specifically selected keywords that we can focus on, and maybe related to financial information. And then we're gonna just one heart rep represent each article as a, a, you know, based on whether this key, each of these keywords is present or not. So it's just basically you know, a feature vector for each article is just, Hey, word one is present or not, word two is, is present or not, and so on. Okay. Um, and then here is a, you know, just for illustration, here is a decision tree. Okay. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just, it's just a, a, you know, tree written in a certain way, but it's basically saying, um, you know, if, if export, if the word export is there, if export is not there, is the word rate there? If the rate is there, if the word rate is there, sorry, uh, is the word, Stake there. If it is, then it's a possible. If not, uh, then see if the venture is there. If the word the venture is there, look at plus one. So just don't worry about the left hand side. It's just a certain way of representing that decision tree. Okay, just a snapshot of part of the decision tree. Okay, it's just a illustration. Uh, so let's say the, the tree has like lots of nodes, 299 nodes. Okay. And uh, um, And it has, uh, you know, it has some performance number. Okay, so you can compute. So it's a 11% error. Uh, the question is, uh, is the tree overfit or is the tree underfit? Okay, I just want to illustrate, and this is just to illustrate in a real realistic setting. You may get to some number once you fit a model within a model class, okay, a particular hypothesis within a model class, and you will have typically a question like, hey, did we do too much, and it's gonna do worse in reality, or did we? Uh, underfit and there's something more to be done if you could if you could if the same features but if you could have used a much more complicated model and not much more but a little bit more complicated model we could have done better okay. so here we're not changing the data or features or anything like that. we're just changing the model class okay. uh, potentially so uh, yeah so this comes down to uh, the question of whether the decision tree model class from before is good enough, right? So instead of decision tree, I could have chosen uh, something else. For example, I could have chosen a binary logic regression model here, right? That's a different model class, okay? That would have potentially some other number. Okay. So the question is how to ensure one hypothesis is better than the other inside a model class, okay? And how to ensure that one model itself is better than the other, or one model class is better than the other. Okay, so whether addition trees are better or whether logic regression models are better. Um, and both are kind of related uh, uh, problems and, and both kind of influence, uh, basically result in overfitting or underfitting. Okay. Let me see if there are any questions. No? Okay, so, to answer, to kind of even partially understand whether we are overfitting, overfitting or underfitting, the only thing that we have on our end is our training data. Okay, there was data that was generated uh, somehow, I mean, is given to us. Based on that, we want to make this uh, assessment of whether we are overfitting or underfitting, right? Um, so let's come back to uh, the starting point, which is 
uh, supervised learning setting, we're going to really again look at it from a status from a probabilistic perspective. Okay, so each example x comma y, a generic example x comma y, a, a data point basically, uh, is given from a distribution, okay. a joint distribution between the input random variable and the output random variable. Okay, now we are using some probabilistic words uh, to describe our setting. Okay. Um, a training examples, uh, which is this collection, which is represented by this uh, letter D, is this collection of observations. There are M of them, is IID independent and identically, identically distributed from this uh, potentially, un, you know, typically unknown joint distribution between X comma Y. Okay, so this is the perspective that we can take. I mean, of course, there's already a bunch of assumptions going on. This is this is an assumption here, independent and identically distributed. So each row, whether you permute the row or not, doesn't matter. You know, each observation is basically uh, unrelated to the other observations. Okay. Okay, and in general, a loss function, which measures uh, the amount of prediction error, okay. with respect to so given a hypothesis, okay, given a hypothesis, there is a delta. Uh, there's this uh, loss function, which is a function which outputs a number. Okay, so if the number is high, loss is high, which means my prediction is kind of far away from the truth. Uh, if hopefully delta is small, then the then the loss is small. My prediction is close to the truth. Okay, the truth here is just the target variable y, and x is the input. Okay, x is processed by the hypothesis to produce a prediction, and then the prediction, you know, uh, all that is encapsulated in this function. Okay, for example, uh, uh, so actually this is not well written. This should be h of x here. Sorry, uh, so delta of h of x. So h of x is some prediction and y is the truth. And you're just saying, hey, h of x is close to y or not. So for example, if, if it's a zero and misclassification error, then it's just saying, hey, is a, you know, for a generic two inputs, if a is equal to b, then there's no loss. If a is not equal to b, then let's say it's loss of one. Okay, so that's just a, this is just an example here. Okay, so now uh, we are gonna define a couple of uh, quantities, okay? Uh, the first quantity is called the, Population error, okay, or, or generalization error, or the true error. Okay, so these are all words: expected loss, expected loss, expected risk, generalization error, or true error. Let's keep, you know, we're going to use one of these uh, consistently, hopefully. Um, so let's call it generalization error. Okay? So what we want is, if somebody gives me a h hypothesis function, okay? somebody gives me a h hypothesis function, I actually want to know what is its performance over the population. Population is actually, when we say you use the word population, just means what is its performance? If I draw a sample from this joint distribution, uh, what is the expected value of this um, error or loss? Okay, what's the expected value of this loss? Okay. So there's an expectation. So what are the random variables? Random variables are X and Y. Okay. X and Y are random variables. And we're just asking, and therefore H of X is a random variable because it's a function of a random variable. Delta is a random variable. It's a function of a bunch of random variables, and so you can take an expectation. Okay, so it's just uh, you know like integrate or, or integrate or sum over all the values x and y pair can take. Uh, this this whatever is the thing that you want to take an average of, and then the probability of that. Okay, so this is just an expansion of this expectation definition, just so that everything is clear. So this is called the generalization error. And everybody, what we ideally want to do is not you know not we have do whatever whatever we've done in the past uh, four lectures. What we want is if we can get for each hypothesis, you know, this for this number, population error or generalization error for each hypothesis, then I can I, I know which, you know, if I can compute this for each hypothesis, then I can pick the hypothesis which has the lowest uh, population error because we know that that's what's going to be used in the future. In the future, if you get samples from the population distribution, the joint distribution, in expectation, the one we chose hopefully is the best one. So this is what we want to get to. But what we only have is training data, okay? And the type of quantities that we can compute are things like this, okay? This is called the empirical loss or the empirical risk, okay? Or also called a sample error. So if you want to use the word generalization error or true error, then this is called the sample error, okay? Or even you can also use training error if you want. So it's basically, if you have M observations, then it's just the uh, average over of the, those M things. You know, can also scale by one by M if you want. I think somebody asked earlier why, you know, why there was no scaling, but you can add a scaling when we're talking about linear regression earlier, okay? And it's just the average of that loss on each of the training data points, okay, of, of, of any given hypothesis. So hypothesis input, 
return a number. Okay, both if you just think of these as functions, Python functions, hypothesis input and a number is returned. Ideally, we want you know a, a scoring function which does which computes this, but all we have access to is this because we only have training data. Okay, we don't have the original joint distribution. Okay. So let's uh, recap what the um, moving parts are. Uh, so there's a real world process, an unknown process, some joint distribution between X and Y. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was some uh, M observations drawn from that joint distribution. We're going to assume that uh, the IID and we're going to call them D train. Okay. So now we're adding a subscript D underscore train to kind of say that these were the ones we're going to use to now start choosing a hypothesis. Okay. So in the sense that D train is what is passed through a learner. A learner is exactly what the process that we've been following. So learner is, hey, take the D train, spit out a KN and classifier. Take the D train, spit out a decision tree, trans decision tree model. Okay, that's what a learner is. Then, you know, so learner produces a you know candidate H, and then uh, we again draw observations from the real world process. Okay, maybe uh, ten thousand observations. Some you know these ten thousand observations are nothing to do with the original ten thousand observations. So original M observations. Okay. Then you know then this H is a you know. Then we take an expectation over those 10,000 observations. So we, what we're trying to do is approximate the generalization error. So generalization error, remember, uh, is, is, is this, okay? This can be approximated by if we had, you know, 10,000 extra examples, 10,000 extra examples, then this can be approximated by that uh, 10,000 uh, additional data points, okay? So our, pro our objective, as I said, is to find H with small generalization error, okay? And error is, of course, defined over the joint distribution. Uh, but what we typically find is, you know, some H, you know, the learner finds is some H where they only have access to training data, okay? So maybe they'll minimize the training error, okay? Uh, and, and find a H, okay? Which is what we've been doing. And that H, we can we can say hey uh, for that h what is the generalization error we don't know but let's say we have this extra data okay this is a second data set okay or what do we call it test data set um, we're going to approximate this generalization error using the test data set okay, of the h that was produced okay so we have the usual training data whatever we've seen over the past few lectures that's exactly this part on the left hand side of the thing we computed h okay uh, in, in fact, in assignment uh, three, we are doing some test train split. So we're gonna relate it to that in a few, few slides. So we are quite familiar with the left-hand side. Okay, What's new is that we need the necessity of this test samples. Okay. Why are test samples needed? Is because exactly, because we, we care about the population performance. Okay. Population performance cannot be given by uh, training samples. And uh, I'll make the point a little bit more clearer uh, in, in maybe the next few slides. But for now, I'll just say that to evaluate H, ideally we want to write this, but we don't know the distribution. So we have to use some proxy for the distribution. So some extra samples so that we can evaluate this. Okay. We don't care about the training fit. Okay. So uh, we, whatever H is there, we actually want to do whether it generalizes well or not in the future. Any questions here? Okay, so um, here is a very uh, a simpler version of cross validation. Uh, it's called, I guess, we're just calling it as hold out cross validation. So what we do is uh, to conform to that previous slide, uh, we are just gonna, you know, one the moment we're given uh, data set D, immediately before doing any analysis, any EDA, any uh, stuff, uh, just break the data set into two two sets, okay? uh, D train and D val. Okay. So D val is actually the uh, thing that D test that you saw earlier. So it's just a separate data set. Okay. And then you just train, uh, you know, you just do exactly what we've been doing, like SGD call SGD on uh, D train and uh, get a H once you've already chosen some uh, function class. Okay, the script H here is just a, you know, linear models. Find the best H in my linear models or find the best H in my uh, logic regression class, or something like that. Okay, uh, which just means like find the best theta. That's what, this is exactly the stuff that we've been doing before on only the training data. And then whatever we got, 
we're putting a hat on it, H hat, because it's, an, it's actually an estimate, okay? It's an estimate based on a, a data set, okay? So it's, a, it's actually an estimator. You, in fact, you can think of it as a, a statistic as well, because it's a function of a bunch of random variables. It's just that those random variables were your training data random variables, if you really wanna think about it that way. But anyway, it's called H hat. Okay? Now this H hat is gonna apply to, is gonna be used with the unseen samples, okay? Held out unseen samples, and that's this uh, number that you can spit out, you know, uh, which is uh, error uh, over the dval of this h hat. Okay, so hopefully this number is proxying again the generalization error, okay? that out of sample error. So you know, basically the test is this this, this number that you computed on the held out data is an approximation for the true error or the generalization error. Okay, and then. Uh, so this, this is what you know is, would be the performance of this model, okay? Uh, you, you think that this, this, this would be the performance uh, of your model. Uh, There's an estimate of your performance of your model. This is the performance of your model, actually, right? Uh, but we don't have the actual distribution, so we can't get that performance. So we are saying, hey, this would approximate that. And what we can do is also compute, uh, for example, if this is a performance number, we can compute some uh, band around it, like, hey, it's going to be, you know, 5% error plus or minus, you know, 1% uh, band, for example. Okay. Um, yeah, so this process you can repeat. I mean, so not, not the partitioning part, but you can pick a different model and then evaluate uh, evaluate its performance. Hopefully that's also a proxy of its generalization error and so on. And you can pick maybe a better, best one, okay? In fact, that's what we do for K-fold cross-validation, but we will not see it today. I will see it next class. But K-fold cross-validation is really about why, why are we doing folds or why are we doing a holdout? It's exactly because of the data that was used to, believe, used to choose your model uh, parameters, okay? In the Y gradient descent or whatever. The same data cannot be reused to say, hey, Orville is gonna perform in the future. Okay. You have to use something else. Okay. And so that's why we're showing you how to use a held out data set to you do that. Any questions about this slide? Okay, so um, let's say we got some number, right? So, um, uh, some, so we got a classifier H hat and we got a held out or hold out using the holdout validation scheme in the previous slide, we got some number, okay? So uh, let's say that number is 0 0.02, okay? So it's only 2% error, okay? Uh, and what we want is, so our goal uh, before trying to build, you know, this find a classifier, let's say a spam classifier, is that we want a classifier which has at least, uh, you know, uh, at most 10% error, okay? So, um, so let's say, you know, Let's say, let's say we want to claim that the uh, true error of the classifier that we found is actually 10% uh, in the population. Okay, so we don't, we cannot uh, evaluate this, but let's say we claim that the true error is 10%. What we observe is the, that the error is only 2% from our held out data. Okay. Then uh, we can run a simple statistical test to say that, hey, we can reject the null, so we can reject the null that the true error is uh, is uh, ten percent. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Okay. So it's just a way to make a case for what is uh, you know uh, in population what is the performance of your model. Okay. So so we have to start with some null hypothesis. The null hypothesis for our model is that hey, it's gonna be ten percent uh, uh, bad. Uh, but what we see is only 2% bad. And so can we reject the null? And, uh, you know, is there significant evidence or in general, uh, in put in other words, is there evidence, significant evidence uh, that the uh, true uh, uh, the true error or the generalization error is actually less than or equal to 10%. Okay. So that's the uh, same question, okay? So, so this uh, statistical significant, uh, significance, if you want to do this, uh, is necessary to claim. So you want that band, okay? You can't just report a number. You want to have confidence that the number is, a, is 
uh, is correct. Okay. Uh, so what it, what we're doing here is basically uh, claim something more than just reporting the held out performance. Okay. You have the held out performance number, which is two uh, percent, but you also wanna instead of like just reporting this and this is my performance in the future, we're gonna not do that. We're gonna say, hey, uh, our performance is gonna be better than ten percent with you know, better than 10%, okay? So we're reporting higher number, but we are uh, confident, okay? We're, we're confident with some 95% confidence, okay? So, and that is just because we, we'll run a statistical test. And what is the test? It's actually quite intuitive. Um, so let's come back to uh, our binomial distribution, okay? So if you think of a binomial distribution, okay, I'm gonna relate it back to our statistical test and confidence in our, in our uh, model performance in, 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 in reality in a second. So uh, the probability of observing Y heads out of N trials, uh, N trials is, is this, right? So if, if, I have, if I have a fair coin, for example, uh, the probability of heading, uh, observing a head in any one trial is 50%, right? Uh, and so I can compute, hey, what's the probability of observing five heads out of 10 trials? Okay, that's just given by M factorial divided by, you know, uh, Order, like 10 factorial divided by five factorial times five factorial times this thing. Okay, so this is just an expression. This is just the density function. So this is just the probability mass function for the binomial distribution. Okay. Um, where this expression with the factorial thing, you can short form, you can do write it this way. Okay. Um, so this actually, you know, can be used in an underlying idea towards a statistical test, which is that you can think of the uh, uh, the bias to be of, of, of a Bernoulli random variable to be the ground truth, which is the true error. The true error is some number between zero to one. Okay, that true error of uh, our, our learned model to be the bias of uh, the Bernoulli random variable. Okay, why? And M is the, okay, so let's say there are M examples in the validation set ignore the training data M for now. Let's say there are M examples in the validation set. So then M is gonna be the number of examples in the validation set and Y is the number of error observations. Okay, so what are we trying to do? So think of, let's say we had a, a validation data, okay, with 100 data points. Actually, there's an example, so I don't wanna give one more set of numbers. So let me uh, say, uh, so let's say we have, uh, let's say we, our null hypothesis is uh, that the error is uh, 0.1. Okay, 10 percent error. Uh, and we have seen 10 errors out of 500 validation examples. So let's say we have 500 validation examples. So uh, out of which we saw 10 errors. And that's why we had a 0.2 or whatever, 2 percent error. Okay, so remember the DVAL error was 2 percent. Then uh, what we want to say is that what is the probability of Y, this Bernoulli random variable, less than or equal to 10? Okay, 10 because from the null hypothesis. Given, uh, you know, given the Bernoulli, sorry, given the binomial situation setting, random variable is related to m is equal to 500, which is the number of trials, and the true bias is 0.1. Okay, so you want to find under the null hypothesis, basically, that if the true bias or the true error is 0.1, what's the probability of me observing uh, less than or equal to 10 errors? Okay, so that's uh, equal to 0.01. Uh, Okay, which is less than some threshold. Okay, which is uh, the conflict, like the alpha. Okay, type one error that you choose. Okay, and since you saw, uh, since uh, it's unlikely, so the probability of seeing less than ten errors uh, under this null hypothesis is actually very small. Okay, um, you can see that it's it's pretty small, and we actually saw. Um, uh, we actually saw something like 10 errors, okay? Um, therefore, we can reject the null. Okay, so we can reject the uh, null that uh, the, the error is 10%. Okay, so in fact, what we're trying to show is that the true performance of this hedge hat that we computed is not 10%. Okay, it's not also, it's also not greater than 10%. Okay, that will be even, even smaller probability here. So basically you're kind of kind of giving a sense of, hey, in validation data, I saw 2% error. In reality, it's not, it's not gonna be greater than 10% under this statistical test, under this statistical model. Okay. Is that 
Is that clear? So we are just doing reporting beyond uh, just the uh, validation performance number or the misclassification number. Any questions here? Uh, depends on what? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat the question. I just remembered that the remote audience wants me to repeat it. So, uh, so the question is, uh, the validation number that we're reporting depends on how we did this step one, which is the 70, 30 split, right? Um, yes, it does depend on that. And uh, there are ways to uh, work around that, but it does depend on the, not in practice, but in theory, it should not in the sense that in theory, each observation is an independent and identity distributed example from that unknown distribution. So the row ordering, you know, is already like, there's no relationship between rows. So whether you took the last 30% and kept the first 30%, first 70%, it should not influence uh, our, you know, our steps here. Okay. Uh, but if you want to hedge against it, you can randomize and, and, and so on if you want. But here we're really not worried about practice uh, too much. Here we're really thinking through what are we reporting? Why just reporting on the training data is not enough? You know, what we should be reporting and can we give it a, get some additional like statistical test or some confidence band around what, whatever we're reporting? Like we can just report the validation number, which is two percent, but we're not stopping there. We're trying to see like if, if validation error is two percent, then in reality, the ground truth uh, performance of this model cannot be, you know, the error cannot be ten percent or more, because if it's ten percent, it's already we are rejecting that null, for example, via this exercise, right? Um, like we can see that if, if, if you think that the ground truth is 10%, that can be rejected because we observed a really small error performance. So it's kind of giving you a sense that, hey, you will not be seeing this model, although I'm reporting in validation, 2% error, in reality, it may not be 2%, but definitely not gonna be 10%. Okay, that because we rejected the null here. Just informally, I'm trying to say the same thing again and again, but um, Yeah, so for, for these types of like uh, misclassification uh, type of uh, uh, error, re error reports, uh, then you can actually just, uh, uh, you know, you can use the idea of bi binomial confidence interval. So, or he, I didn't show a confidence interval before, but uh, we can actually get a confidence interval. So how are you gonna get a confidence interval? So that's what we'll see in the slide. So. Okay, so here I'm again changing the example a little bit. So let's say we have uh, nine out of 40 examples are incorrectly classified in DVAL. Okay, so instead of that um, previous slide number, so let's say this is a different illustration. This is just to try to get a confidence interval okay? here in this slide. You can, you can use the same idea from previous slide. Same numbers as previous slide, but uh, instead of that, we're just changing the numbers. So let's say we got this performance. So nine out of 40, okay, that's the, uh, uh, validation uh, performance. Okay, the question is like, where does the true uh, generalization error? Okay, what is the true error or the generalization error lie uh, with a ninety-five percent confidence? Okay, so so you build a confidence interval which itself is an estimate or a statistical estimate. Does that cover this true number, this true performance, with ninety-five percent chance? Okay, that's what we want. So every time. So if you have a different validation set, you'll get a different interval. You know, you'll get keep getting different different intervals. Ninety-five percent of the time, that interval should contain this fixed unknown quantity, which is the uh, generalization error of this H hat. Okay. Um, so the way we're going to do it is just approximate the binomial with a Gaussian distribution and just use the Gaussian idea. So, uh, so, so think of the think of this. Uh, number of trials, right? So we said, you know, why we saw in the previous slide is a bino binomial random variable. It's just a, takes a value between zero heads to whatever, all the M heads. So let's say, you know, uh, if the, so we are, so if the variance is, variance of this random variable is high enough and how do you get the variance? So 
what is the expectation of this random variable right expectation of this random variable is just uh, the number of heads okay number of successes success trials or whatever fail trials so that's nine okay we know the expectation of this uh, random variable the variance of this random variable uh, is m so for a binomial distribution binomial distribution is m times the bias times one minus bias okay so some number uh, we're just saying that if this number is greater than five then we can do a normal approximation okay what is uh, so what are we trying to do uh we're trying to say hey in um in the data we have seen nine errors okay so so nine errors so so nine is the mean here so nine minus some quantity and nine plus some quantity is my estimated confidence confidence interval okay so of course the minus quantity and the plus quantity uh influence the confidence level of my confidence interval okay so 95% confidence interval just means that you pick these numbers the left hand and the right hand such that uh the the true whatever the true number lies in this interval 95% of the time okay so that's what we want okay. so uh, and here we we just chose uh the number by doing a normal approximation so this this is just looking up um so 1.96 and minus 1.96 just come from uh you might have seen this when you're doing a z score uh you know um uh, um yeah Yeah, this is just the uh, testing for normality. So what is called Z test, sorry. I forgot the name. Uh, so anyway, so from this, you basically are saying that the true performance or, or the true error or generalization error is between a, low, a lower bound and an upper bound. And those are just uh, computed by uh, these two numbers. So, any questions about this? So what what have what has happened in the past couple of slides is we got the validation number. One thing what we did is do a hypothesis test. If the validation number is two percent, you can certainly you know in in reality you will not probably have greater than ten percent error. Okay, that was what the previous slide is saying. In this slide, what you're saying is uh, whatever is your performance validation performance, we're gonna we can give you a ninety five percent confidence of uh, uh, of we can give you an from that single estimate, we can get to two numbers, which is the confidence lower bound and the confidence upper bound, which define the confidence interval, such that the true error belongs to that interval with uh, you know 95% chance. Okay. So we just uh, you know it's it's the same type of statement. So basically saying you got some validation number from which we can can you make a claim about what the generalization error performance is? Yeah. So like if you're rejecting the null hypothesis, then does it mean that we are rejecting the model? No, we are not uh, rejecting the model. Uh, we are rejecting the error. So model is uh, already like is not a uh, is not the quantity here. It's just the performances. We don't get, we have uh, some true performance, which is this, which you don't know. Okay, and uh, we are just hypothesizing the true performance ten percent. From this slide, like the idea that eventually we are trying to either reject or accept the null hypothesis. Of of whether the true performance of the model is ten percent or not. So let's say you want to say so it's not really performance; it's like true error, error, error rate. Right. So true generalization. So true true error or the generalization of error of the model you don't know because it, it there's a subscript p which is actually distribution depends on the unknown distribution which you don't know. What if somebody comes and says, hey, uh, the the true error of the model, uh, the fixed model here h hat, uh, is ten percent. Okay, you found out from your uh, held out data validation that it's two percent. Okay, can you reject the null that uh, 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 the true error uh, or the generalization error is actually ten percent? We can reject that. That's what we're doing. We're rejecting the null that the generalization error is ten percent. So basically, we are just trying to evaluate the model at this level. No, it's a fixed model. Uh, the whether you say it's a ten percent error or it's fifteen percent error, whether it's Five percent. For example, let's say I want to say, hey, I want to. You so this is a little bit roundabout way of saying that you cannot claim that, for example, the uh, generalization error of the model is let's say five percent. Why is that? Because then you will not be able to reject the null given your evidence of your validation data. Whereas if you had, uh, if you want to make a claim that, hey, my 
true performance or the generalization error of this model is 10 percent you'll be able to uh, reject you'll be able to reject that because you you see a much less um, error so the model is fixed in this in these slides h hat okay we got it from training data so ignore the training data and the fix, just keep the fixed model now we had this validation data okay which is like 500 in this, this example where we saw that this model is producing 10, 10 errors okay so we observed 2% error error rate now what can we say about how will the model perform perform in, in the in the wild are you going to say hey it's going to perform at 2% error rate in the future that's not correct right so what we're trying to say is that we think that the model is not going to not going to perform worse than 10% error that's because even at the 10% level we can reject that null that the error the performance is 10% Indirectly, I'm saying that my model is not right because right now my model is saying that it has only two percent of error rate. But in the future or in the the, the actual number that we have, it's ten percent. So basically, my model is always at one to hundred today. The result. Basically. We don't know what the true error rate of this this model that we picked is. So basically, you're not happy because I'm saying. So actually, we are trying to compare null value, which is zero point one, with the model value that I'm getting through ten by point two. Yeah, point zero two. Yeah. Um, not, From this, we are rejecting the null that this uh, this this model has a uh, ten percent error. So exactly, what are we That's correct, right? Like, I'm rejecting the null. Yeah, so the model doesn't have too much higher error rate. That's what we are saying. So, for example, we can reject the null uh, that the model has ten percent error rate. We can reject the null suddenly when the model has twenty percent error rate because that that means that this is even rare. So we can reject. So what we are trying to say is that the what is the true performance of the model? We don't know. Is it ten percent error rate? No, that's not true. Is it twenty percent error? That's not true. Is it thirty percent error? That's not true. So it has to be something less than ten percent in in the real world for this given model. That's what we are trying to claim, kind of in a roundabout way. We are trying to say what the performance of the model is in, in the real world, right? So there has to be some number you want to associate, some upper bound. Okay, the model is not going to do more than ten uh, percent errors, right? So that's what we are saying. It's not going to do more than ten percent errors because even ten percent is we can reject because what we observed is much better than ten percent. Because basically, I'm trying to say that I'm rejecting the. Oh, we are out of time, one, but. And my model is going to be in this scenario. My model is better than in comparison to my null hypothesis, right? Uh, the model is better or not is not the question. Then, what is the what is the performance of the model? Is unclear. Whether it's better than something else is not important here. We have a hedge hat. We just want to know what is how is it going to perform in, in the future. What number will you ascribe to it? Like, is it, does it have ten percent error rate? Does it have five percent error rate? Does it have two percent error rate? We don't know okay, because we don't have the distribution. What's it? We're just making a comparison with the zero Yeah, we just we cooked up this point one and said uh, what we observe is only this two percent error. In the validation, we cooked up some number and said it. You know that number under that number, this is too rare, and so that number is not correct. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, uh, end uh, pretty much right now, uh, and uh, we'll resume with this discussion uh, next time. Okay.